It's my pleasure to introduce Father Paul De Laterante, our Diocesan Secretary for Religious Education and Sacred Liturgy, as he guides us into our first reflection this morning, really trying to step back from uh, the Jubilee of Mercy and understand what are the basics, what does the Holy Father have in mind for the goals and intentions of this year. So uh, what better person to do that than our own Father De Laterante? And um, I welcome him here. Thank you, Soren. And it's good to be here with everyone this morning. You know, anyone who has worked in or for the church for any length of time knows that we often speak in a kind of a code. Not the Da Vinci Code, but <laughs> the language that we use sometimes says uh, more than you would think. So when I was um, invited to give this presentation here. Invitation doesn't mean quite what you think it means. <laughs> but it's a joy to be with you. Um, even though I want to paraphrase the words of uh, some of the lyrics to that old Sam Cooke song, some of you may know it, Wonderful World, where, you know, the singer says, don't know much about history, don't know much about biology, etc. Well, I don't know much about theology, <laughs> but I do know much about mercy because I've been on the receiving end of God's mercy countless times in my life. And I hope that in some way, not only through priestly ministry, but in other ways too, that I've been able to share mercy and show mercy to others. And that's what we want to take a look at here this morning. What really does the Holy Father mean for us as he invites us to enter into this jubilee, this extraordinary jubilee of mercy? A few weeks ago when Art and I met with Soren to talk about the structure of our morning here. Soren mentioned that um, he had been talking with some parishioners and they didn't seem to know much about what a jubilee year was all about. And someone said, well, isn't that like a year-long parish picnic? <laughs> well, it might be, but there are some other important aspects to a jubilee year. The idea goes back to the Old Testament. Hopefully everybody can see the screen here. But in the book of Leviticus, we read, this 50th year you shall make sacred by proclaiming liberty in the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when every one of you shall return to his own property, every one to his own family estate. We might wonder what property and land and returning to one's estate has to do with a jubilee of mercy. But if you think about that brief little verse from Leviticus, the jubilee year, as God had designed it and revealed it to the people of Israel, had really three main provisions to it. First, the jubilee year, the 50th year, was meant to be a time when the land, when the soil, would rest. These verses from Leviticus were revealed to the people of Israel at a time when they were largely an agricultural society. So farmers were out sowing crops. Year after year, the land was expected to yield a harvest. But then there came a time a jubilee year when that land would rest. No crops would be sown. The soil would have a chance to be revitalized, and to be renewed. A second purpose of the jubilee year was that property would be restored to its original owner. And connected with this was the third purpose, that not only would property be restored to its original owner, but any member of the people of Israel, any Israelite who had sold himself into slavery would be liberated, would be set free. 
There were moments in the life of Israel when those, especially who were poor, had no other means of supporting themselves or their families, so they sold themselves as slaves. The Jubilee year was meant to be a time then of liberation, a time of return, and a time of restoration. And so in scripture, as the people of Israel experience and live the Jubilee year every 50th year, they began to see certain connections that I think are important as we are about to enter the extraordinary Jubilee of mercy. First, the Jubilee year was always connected with the Sabbath day of rest. We hear that spoken of in the book of Genesis. We know the story of creation that after the Lord God had made the visible creation throughout the six days, Genesis tells us that on the seventh day, God rested from his labors, from all the work that he had undertaken. What does this Sabbath rest really mean? For the people of Israel, the Sabbath rest was a time of holiness. God sets aside the Sabbath day, the seventh day, so that we can consecrate that time to him. And in consecrating that time to God, we are called to enter into the worship of God, which is why we have religious services in Judaism on Saturday, for us, Sunday, the new Sabbath, the new beginning of creation. But the Sabbath day is a time of holiness, rest, so that we can worship God and give him thanks for his many blessings. This, by the way, ties into why the Jubilee year in scripture was established every 50 years. How do you get 50? If you take a week, which is seven days, multiply that by seven. Every seventh year was to be a mini kind of jubilee, as it were. Seven times seven gives you 49. Then God establishes the 50th year. It's a great time of jubilee. In fact, every Sabbath, for us, every Sunday is meant to be a mini jubilee as well. It's a holy day that we keep to honor the Lord, to pray to him, to worship him, to find some rest, hopefully from our labors, and to express our thanks and gratitude for all that God has done for us, certainly through the past week, but also in salvation history. So these ideas were very much a part of the mind of the people of Israel. Secondly, as we saw from the quotation from Leviticus chapter 25, the Jubilee year was also connected with the forgiveness of debts and the notion of restoration, property returning to its owner. If someone had sold himself into slavery, he would be restored to his family, to his inheritance. So that theme of renewal and restoration is very prominent in the notion of the Jubilee as we find it in the Old Testament. But the Jubilee also had, and still has, a theological character to it. It's not just a time to look at and talk about economic rights or inheritance law. Why was property returned? Why? Could slaves be set free? Why was this connected with the Sabbath day as a time of giving thanks and worship to God for his blessings? Because God himself is the one who has and always does forgive the debts of his people. God himself is the one who takes the initiative in restoring us to his grace and restoring us to his friendship. And so as time went on in the history of Israel and the Old Testament, the Jubilee year itself 
began not only to look backwards in gratitude for God's gifts and blessings, but it also pointed forward. Forward to what scripture scholars speak of as the messianic year. The day of the Lord is a prominent theme, especially in the later prophets of the Old Testament. We see this in the book of the prophet Isaiah. If you look at Isaiah chapter 61, verses one and two, the prophet says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has, has anointed me. He has sent me to proclaim glad tidings, to preach liberty to captives, to restore sight to the blind, to announce a year of favor from the Lord. Now, if those words sound a little bit familiar, they should, because that is the text Jesus uses in his first public sermon in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. In Luke chapter 4, we see how the Lord returns to Nazareth, enters into the synagogue, stands up to do the reading, and unrolls the scroll, finding passage from Isaiah 61. He quotes that passage and says at the end of it, after he has finished and he rolls up the scroll and sits down to teach, he says, today, this scripture passage, this year of favor, this jubilee is fulfilled in your hearing. The coming of Christ, God's promises reach their fulfillment the coming of Christ, God's mercy is made present, is personified in Jesus of Nazareth. And so the Lord takes up that ancient text from the prophet Isaiah and extends it. The Jubilee year now no longer concerns just the people of Israel, but the Messiah has come for universal salvation to restore all humanity, indeed to restore all creation to God's favor and grace. Through Jesus Christ, God's friendship will now be offered to all of humanity. And with his life, with his teachings, with his public mission and ministry, and above all, through his death and resurrection, there will be, for the entirety of creation, that restoration of the original harmony and freedom which God had always intended for his world and for each of us. So just a little scriptural background on the whole idea of the Jubilee, and hopefully we can take some of those ideas and see how they might apply to the extraordinary Jubilee year that's about to begin in a few weeks. But before I do that, just some dates. In the life of the church, especially in uh, papal teaching and papal activity, dates are often significant. And so, as Soren said in your packets, you have a copy of Pope Francis's letter technically called a bull of indiction, that announces the jubilee year. A letter entitled, Misericordiae Voltus, the face of mercy. If you notice, this letter was signed on April 11th of this year, of 2015. April 11th happened to be the vigil of the second Sunday of Easter, a Sunday also known as Divine Mercy. Sunday. How appropriate to sign the Bull of Indiction proclaiming a Jubilee year on the vigil of the Sunday devoted in a special way to the Divine Mercy. I think we all know that the Jubilee year will begin on December the 8th of this year of 2015 and it will conclude on November 20th, 2016. November 20th is the Solemnity of Christ the King. December the 8th, as we know, is the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. On December the 8th, Pope Francis will inaugurate this extraordinary Jubilee year by opening the Holy Door 
or the Door of Mercy in St. Peter's Basilica. And then on the following Sunday, December 13th, 2015, which is the third Sunday of Advent, Pope has invited every bishop in his own diocese to open at his cathedral church a door of mercy, a holy door, as a sign that those who are not able to make a pilgrimage to Rome can still share in the Jubilee indulgence. We'll talk about the indulgence in just a few minutes. Those dates, as I said, are significant. Why? Because each date focuses our attention on the person of Jesus Christ, who, as Pope Francis says at the very beginning of his Bull of Indiction, is the face of the Father's mercy. Just think about what those dates mean. Obviously, the Vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday calls our attention to the mercy that God has shown us in the death and the resurrection of Christ. We are in the Easter season when the Pope signed the Bull of Indiction, a time of great joy, but a time to recognize that in the cross and in the resurrection of the Lord, we find the concrete expression and communication of God's merciful love for each of us and for all of humanity. December 8th, if we think about December 8th as the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. Here again, that solemnity points not simply to Our Lady's role in salvation history, but she was conceived without any stain of sin in view of God's design that she be the mother of his son, that she be the vehicle, as it were, the instrument through which our salvation enters the world. Mary be the way through which God's mercy comes and assumes our human nature in order to heal it and to elevate it. December 13th third Sunday of Advent. We might wonder why that date is significant in terms of the Jubilee Year of Mercy, but September or December 13th, rather, that third Sunday of Advent is also known as Gaudete Sunday. Gaudete, a Latin word. You get a bonus. You don't even have to pay for it. You get some Latin thrown in here. <laughs> Gaudete meaning rejoice. Why do we rejoice? Because on that third Sunday of Advent, we realize how near our salvation is, that Christmas is only just about a week or so, 10 days or so away, and we celebrate the nearness of God to his people in the coming birth of our Savior. And of course, November 20th, the Solemnity of Christ the King, we place all of creation under the Lordship of Christ. As we heard in yesterday's gospel, Jesus exercises his lordship and messiahship not by dominating others, but by serving and giving of himself. And in that self-giving, the mercy of God is conveyed throughout the world. So the dates are, I think, interesting and, and significant because in this Jubilee year, you and I are called to look to Jesus Christ as model, pattern, the standard face of God's mercy among us. Pope Francis, in his Bull of Indiction, writes quite a bit about mercy, as we would expect. And we hear about it a lot. We talk about mercy. We receive it. Hopefully, we show it to others, but what really does mercy mean? I just wanted to spend a few moments looking at the idea of mercy in sacred scripture, but before I do that, I think it would be helpful to take a look at what two great saints, two great doctors of the church have said about mercy. 
St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Augustine, as you can see there, points out that mercy is heartfelt sympathy for another's distress, impelling us to succor him, to help him out if we can. St. Thomas Aquinas will quote those words of Augustine in Aquinas's great work, the Summa Theologiae. St. Thomas says in one place in the Summa, mercy takes its name, misericordia, the Latin word, from denoting a man's compassionate heart. And he breaks it apart, the miserum cor, the compassionate heart for another's <clears throat> unhappiness. And then Aquinas goes on to say that mercy is to be attributed especially to God seen in its effect, it most properly belongs to him to dispel that misery. You might ask, well, what misery? Well, certainly we all know that we have ourselves experienced misery and unhappiness at different times in our lives. We've been in distress, maybe physically with an illness or the weaknesses that come with advancing age. We might be at times in financial distress, financial misery, and if we're not, we certainly have encountered people who are. But we also know that there is a spiritual unhappiness, a spiritual distress, a spiritual misery that from time to time can afflict us and others whom we know, others whom we love, others whom we care about, even those we might not know so well can still be in a condition of spiritual distress. The greatest spiritual distress, the greatest misery and unhappiness that any one of us can experience is that of sin. Hence, St. Thomas points out that God acts to dispel that distress. It's in his very nature to go out of himself, to open his heart, as it were, to us, both individually and collectively, because we are at a distance from him because of sin, original sin, and the sins that you and I commit. As even the Psalms tell us, the just man sins seven times a day. So if that's true, you can imagine the trouble I'm in. It doesn't bear thinking about. But God acts to dispel that. And that is his mercy, his compassion extended to us to relieve us from our state of unhappiness, from our condition of distress, sometimes physical, sometimes financial, sometimes emotional, always certainly spiritual. So if you keep those quotations from St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas kind of in the back of your mind. Well, Francis, in his Bull of Indiction, in paragraphs 6 and 7, turns first to the Old Testament. And he does not do an entire exegesis of the Old Testament, and we're not going to do one here. This would take us, you know, the rest of this month. You might enjoy that, not having to go to work, but I don't think Bishop would be too happy if we were here studying scripture all day. So I just want to point out that Pope Francis begins talking about how God shows his mercy by turning to the Psalms, and there's a list of them, and I just gave you the citations. If you look in um, paragraph six and seven of his Bull of Indiction, Pope Francis actually gives the little uh, verses. So you can read those, and it's worth reading, not just seeing numbers on a page, but to read the Psalms, because in the Psalms, which are really the prayer of Israel, we constantly encounter the theme that the Lord is patient and merciful. Some translations will also say the Lord is kind and merciful. Whether we choose kind or patient, it really means the same thing. 
God gives to us every opportunity that we need to be on the receiving end of his merciful love. And all he asks is that we turn to him with a humble and contrite heart. And so we find this expressed. Psalm 103, 146, 147. Psalm 136 is an important psalm. Pope Francis spends a little bit of ink on that particular psalm. It's known in Hebrew as the Hallel Psalm. And it's important because as a refrain, we find the phrase, for his mercy endures forever. After each verse, that comes back as a kind of refrain. The psalm praises God for his mighty deeds. And it says, for his mercy endures forever. We give thanks to the Lord for his mercy endures forever. We bless the Lord who has done this, that, and the other for his mercy endures forever. Over and over again, it's thematic. What's also interesting about Psalm 136 is that this was the psalm that Jesus and his apostles would have sung as they were making their way from the Last Supper in the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a psalm, a liturgical song of praise for God's goodness and greatness. And that goodness was about to be shown in its most complete and full form in the death and then the resurrection of the Lord. So as Jesus is facing his own approaching death, what is he doing? He is singing of the mercy of God that endures forever and that is about to be communicated to us and to the world through his self-offering on the cross. Pope Francis also points to the text I just mentioned earlier from, <clears throat> from Isaiah and also from Micah and some other passages there. So you can read those. I don't want to take too much time here this morning, but it's important to see that running through the whole of the Old Testament, both in words and in deeds, we gain a picture of the mercy of God and how he deals with us who are in need of that mercy. In the following paragraphs, paragraphs 8 and 9 of Misericordiae Voltus, Pope Francis turns to the New Testament. And again, we find, of course, a central focus on the person of Jesus Christ and how he shows mercy in dealing with people who are wounded, who are hurting, who are sinful, who are in need of healing, both physical and spiritual. But at the end of that slide, and again, you can read the citations and pray about them and use them hopefully for meditation and contemplation. But again, at the end, Pope Francis quotes the verse from Luke chapter 6, verse 36, which is kind of cut off there, but what you can't really see too well at the bottom is Luke chapter 6, verse 36. And here, Jesus says to his disciples, after he's spoken about the need for love your enemies, he challenges them and gives them an invitation, a call, but also a challenge to be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. That's Luke 6, 36. Pope Francis has taken that verse and made it the kind of the motto, if you will, of the Jubilee year, to be merciful as the Father is merciful, merciful like the Father. So how then do we become merciful like the Father? Well, first of all, we need to receive mercy ourselves. We can't really extend mercy to someone else unless we're conscious of our own need for the mercy of God in our lives. And Pope Francis, in his Bull of Indiction, talks about some concrete signs. We won't go through the whole um, thing paragraph by paragraph, but some concrete signs, one of which is pilgrimage. Certainly, 
the opportunity would exist to make a pilgrimage to Rome, to the papal basilicas, St. Peter's, St. John Lateran, St. Mary Major, and St. Paul outside the walls. And in each of those papal basilicas, there is a holy door, which the Pope has also termed a door of mercy. But even if we cannot make a pilgrimage to Rome, Pope Francis wants each diocese throughout the world to share in this means of receiving God's mercy. And so, as I mentioned, he has invited every bishop to designate a holy door at the cathedral church in each diocese. And the possibility exists for other churches as well. So that those who pass through the either the cathedral door that's been designated as a holy door or who make a pilgrimage to Rome can <clears throat> participate and share in the fruits of the Jubilee indulgence, which I'm going to come to in a moment. Why is pilgrimage important? Well, Francis writes in paragraph 14 of Misericordiae Vultus that pilgrimage is a sign <clears throat> that mercy is also, as he says, a goal to reach. We take a step towards the Lord at his invitation, at his prompting, but we have to take that step towards him so as to receive his mercy. And when we make a pilgrimage, we set out from the place where we are, where we live, where we reside, certainly physically, but even spiritually, where we are living spiritually, we set out for a destination. And the purpose of a pilgrimage is not simply just a sightseeing tour, but it is a sign that I want to be interiorly changed. I want to be different when I come back to my home. Pilgrimage also, Pope Francis writes, requires some dedication and sacrifice. Certainly, it would be a sign of dedication and require a sacrifice to spend the money to fly to Rome and walk through the holy doors there. But even in our own diocese, any diocese for that matter, it might be uh, a sacrifice to drive to the cathedral, certainly given traffic. That uh, is very much uh, on our minds. Um, <clears throat> as a friend of mine once said, talking about pilgrimage, we shouldn't have to suffer but we shouldn't always be totally comfortable either. So a pilgrimage puts us in mind of making some kind of sacrifice, whether it's in our diocese or in Rome itself. It's also an impetus to conversion. In the Middle Ages, pilgrimage was very often a penance that a confessor would assign, especially if someone had committed some pretty serious sin. And we know, and perhaps some or many of you have been to different places of pilgrimage. Canterbury in England, Compostela, Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain, Rome itself, of course, the Holy Land. A few other sites became very well known as places of pilgrimage. And those who went on that pilgrimage did so as an act of penance, but also as an act that led them to a conversion of life. And that's the aim of a pilgrimage, as I mentioned, to be a little bit different, having made the pilgrimage, than we might have been before. Another initiative Pope Francis talks about in his Bull of Indiction is the 24 hours for the Lord, and availability of the Sacrament of Penance uh, or Sacrament of Reconciliation. You can find this in paragraph 17 of Misericordiae Voltus. We're still discussing how that might work out here in our own diocese, but certainly the Pope's hope would be that people could experience mercy and receive mercy through the sacrament of penance and a wide availability of that sacrament in every diocese throughout the world. That's another concrete sign. Pope Francis has said that he intends to commission priests as missionaries of mercy on Ash Wednesday, this coming Ash Wednesday, and he would give to them the charge to 
preach mercy wherever they go, wherever they might be invited, and also he gives them the faculty, the power to forgive even sins that normally would be reserved to the Holy See for absolution. It's a concrete sign that Pope Francis wants us all to be able to receive the mercy of God, however much we might be in need of that mercy. Again, we're still discussing um, how that might work and what that might look like here in our own diocese, but certainly Pope Francis wants people not to be bound by sin or impeded by sin from coming to know the mercy of God and being restored to the family and above all the sacramental life of the church. I had mentioned the Jubilee indulgence, so just briefly um, what that means. First of all, what's an indulgence? Indulgence is very simply the remission of temporal punishment due to sin. What does that mean? When we sin, when we offend against God, against neighbor, even our own, what we might think of as private and personal sins, we bear guilt for that. I have done wrong. I know I've done wrong. A relationship has been harmed, wounded, perhaps in a slight way, maybe even broken off in a much more serious way. And so I need the guilt of that sin to be forgiven. That's what happens in the sacrament of penance. When we go to confession, the guilt of our sin is remitted, is removed, is absolved. But there remain, as Pope Francis points out in paragraph 22 of Misericordiae Vultus, there remains the heritage, the residue, we might say, the consequences of sin. And that's what we call temporal punishment. It's the effects, if you will, of sin. And these need also to be remitted. We need to be purified and stand clean in the sight of God. And the temporal punishment due to sin can be remitted either in this life or in the next, which is really what we mean when we talk about the doctrine of purgatory, but that's a whole other subject. But an indulgence then remits those temporal punishments, the residue, the heritage, the effects of my wrongdoing are cleaned up, as it were. They are removed. As Pope Francis puts it, through the Jubilee indulgence, we gain an experience of the full fruits of Christ's redemption that extend to the entire life of the believer. So an indulgence is a great spiritual gift that the Lord, again in his mercy, opens up for us. In order to gain that indulgence, there are some conditions, and you can see those there. First is that we do make a pilgrimage, either to one of the papal basilicas in Rome or to the church, the cathedral, or perhaps some other shrine that a diocesan bishop would designate, and that we pass through the holy door, the door of mercy. As we do that, the other conditions that are attached to gaining an indulgence also apply. We should go to sacramental confession. And this can be done within a certain period of time. Um, so if we, let's say, the Jubilee year begins on December 8th, you say, okay, on December 12th, which is a Saturday, I'm going to go to the cathedral and walk through the holy door. You do that, and then within a certain period of time, you should also go to confession and receive Holy Communion. Ideally, this would be done on the day that you would make the pilgrimage, but it could be done either you know, within a matter of weeks before or after. And within the church, one of the basilicas in Rome or the cathedral church or some other diocesan shrine, the last condition would be that we make a profession of faith, that we recite the creed, as we just heard Father Ferguson and Father Scalia do before us this morning, and that we also pray for the intentions 
of the Holy Father. There really aren't any specified prayers for that part. An Our Father, a Hail Mary, a Glory Be, sufficient other prayers that we might offer, but with the mindset that we're praying for the intentions of the Holy Father, and then we can gain that jubilee indulgence. Because Pope Francis wants as many people as possible to know the mercy of God in their lives, he has extended the Jubilee Indulgence to those who are sick. If they can't physically make a pilgrimage, they can spiritually do so in their homes, hospital, a nursing home, a retirement home, assisted living facility, whatever, even to prisoners, which I hope will not apply to any of us in this coming year. But if it does, if you enter your cell, you can imagine you're entering through a holy door. So not that I'm recommending that to you, but if it happens, you know you can gain an indulgence. It won't set you out of, it won't get you out of jail, but it will get you out of the spiritual consequences of that. The Jubilee indulgence, as you see there, can be obtained for yourself, which is a good thing or it can be obtain, obtained for someone who is deceased, which is also a good thing. We can receive mercy, and Pope Francis lists some of these very practical ways in his full of indiction, but we are also called to show mercy, to practice it. Mercy, Pope Francis tells us, is not only an action of the Father, but it becomes a criterion for our own discipleship, especially in this Jubilee year, but even beyond. We're not just to be passive recipients of God's mercy, as important as that is in our lives. We're also to be active members of the church in whose pastoral activity the mercy of God can be revealed. So how then do we show mercy? Well, I don't want to steal Art Bennett's thunder here, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. Just to mention something Pope Francis mentions in his Bull of Indiction, namely the practice of the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Soren said in the welcome packets, you have a little card listing those. Here they are. They're in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Once the Jubilee year begins, we hope to have them prominently displayed on the Herald's website or the diocesan website um, so that they always come up and we can be reminded not only of, of what they are, but of the fact that Pope Francis has also said that anyone who personally performs one or more of these corporal or spiritual works of mercy will surely share in the Jubilee indulgence. So notice how available, how widely available Pope Francis wants to make, as it were, the mercy of God, or at least, I shouldn't say the mercy of God, he wants to make as widely available as possible the opportunities for us to receive the mercy of God. That's probably a better way of saying it. We might ask, and Pope Francis raises this point here, well, what about justice? You know, does, is mercy better than justice? We, we talk a lot about mercy, but you know, shouldn't people get what they deserve if they do wrong? And we might at times you know, have those same thoughts going through our own hearts. Well, justice, essentially in scripture, is seen as the faithful abandonment of oneself to God's will. Justice is a virtue. It's the virtue by which I have a firm will to give to another what is his or her due, what I owe to someone else. As a virtue, the virtue of justice gives a habitual strength and habitual power to do what is good, to give to another what I owe that person. 
And so in the course of this jubilee year, but even beyond that, we might ask ourselves, well, what do I owe God? And what do I owe my neighbor? And in asking those kinds of questions, justice then has to do with living and acting in a right relationship, first and foremost with God himself, and then with my brothers and sisters. If we look at justice in that way, being in a right relationship with one another, and <clears throat> of course with God, then we can see that justice and mercy are not really opposed to each other. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us this. Mercy, he says, does not destroy justice, but in a sense is the fullness thereof. Imagine someone who is homeless and hungry knocks on your door and asks for something to eat. And you say, yes, come in, I'll give you a sandwich. Here's a sandwich. It's an act of justice. I owe someone some food. I have a surplus. I can, I can easily do that. But then I might say, here, take a sandwich, but also here, have a thermos of coffee, have some cookies to go. You know what? You need a coat. Have a coat. You need some shoes. Take some shoes. That's mercy, surpassing justice. Mercy means that we recognize that there is a debt. We recognize that <clears throat> there is a relationship that needs to be put right, but it goes beyond that. Think of the gospel parable that Jesus tells about the king who decided to settle accounts with his servants, and he brings one in who owes him a huge amount. We might think in terms of a million dollars. The servant has no way of repaying it. And the master, he, he asks the master, please, you know, be patient. I'll pay it back. I, I really will. I want to. And the master, Jesus tells us in the parable in Matthew's gospel, is moved with pity. That compassionate heart that St. Thomas spoke about, that St. Augustine spoke about. The master has a compassionate heart toward his servant who is in difficulty, and so he writes off the debt. He cancels it. He recognizes there's a debt. Yes, you owe me a million dollars, and the fulfillment of that would be justice. But the master then says, you know what? I forgive you. It's okay. Do not worry about it. So the one servant has been on the receiving end of the master's mercy, but then as the parable goes on, and we know it well, he meets a fellow servant who owes him just a fraction. The first servant owed a million dollars to his master, now he meets someone else who owes him ten dollars. And what does he say? Instead of showing mercy and extending mercy, he grabs him, starts choking him, pay back what you owe. And when he can't, he has him thrown in prison. Which servant are we called to be? Which image are we called to adopt in our lives? Certainly, we have been grateful for receiving God's mercy, and now we're called to show it to others. To recognize, yes, there are debts, there are relationships that need to be restored, there are wrongs that need to be set right, but mercy, as St. Thomas tells us, does not deny justice. Rather, it surpasses it. God, in our regard, recognizes that we owe him a debt that we could never repay. When Adam sinned, in perfect justice, God could have written it all off. He could have said, well, that's it. You sinned, you had your chance, and you blew it. But he didn't do that. Instead, as Pope Francis writes, he envelops it. He surpasses justice with a greater event, the event of the cross, the event in which we experience the love of God as the foundation of <clears throat> true justice. And so Pope Francis continues, 
God's justice is his mercy given to everyone as a grace that flows from the death and resurrection of Christ. When we look at a crucifix, what do we see there? We see what we owe to God. But we're not on that cross. Jesus is. God himself, as one of the prefaces in the Roman Missal puts it, has fashioned a remedy for us out of our own mortality, out of our own human nature, so that God did on our behalf what we could not have done for ourselves. And that is his mercy extended to us in the sign of the cross. Well, dear friends, we come to the best part of our, my little talk here this morning, the part that begins in conclusion, <laughs> which is what everybody waits for. Have a look here. Um, a little distorted, but you might recognize this is Rembrandt's famous portrait of the prodigal son. And I chose this because I think this, I've always liked it, but I think it is in many ways an image of the Jubilee Year of Mercy, and it is also an image for us. It's an image of the Jubilee Year because what happens to the prodigal son? There is a return, a re-entry of this son who has departed from his father's house, who has squandered his inheritance, who has taken the, the father's property and basically thrown it away, and now he comes back. And he desires to return. You might connect this what I had mentioned at the beginning, that notion of the Sabbath rest. We want to enter once more into God's own heart and give gratitude, give thanks to him for his mercy. If you look at the image, and I know it's a little hard to see, but you can Google it if you want and take a look at it more carefully and more closely. What do we see? We see the father embracing the son his arms enveloping him, just as God's mercy envelops us. What's interesting, too, and I'm not sure that you can see it here, but if you look at that picture a little more closely in other media, Rembrandt painted the father's hands in two different ways. The left hand is more masculine, as it were. It's, it's you know, a bit more wrinkled. It's rough. It's the hand of a farmer who's been plowing a field for much of his life. The right hand, Rembrandt painted in a much softer way, much more delicate, more feminine, we could say, showing that the father in the painting who represents God embraces us tenderly but strongly at the same time, and welcomes us back into his house as the father in the parable welcomed back his prodigal son. Furthermore, in the parable, and Rembrandt shows this in the painting, there is restoration. Remember the Jubilee was all about restoring land and inheritance and freedom. Well, that is what the son discovers when he returns to the father's house. He receives back his dignity as a son, as a child of a loving father. So the sandals that are brought out, the robe that is placed upon him, the ring given to him are all signs of sonship and of reconciliation and of a renewed dignity and life. And certainly there is a restoration to the family. Again, one of the main purposes or aims of the Jubilee year in Israel was to restore liberty to captives, people who had been slaves could go back to their family and be welcomed home. Well, in a way, all of us are slaves to sin. And this Jubilee year is a time for us to come back into the family of God. As God, who is the Father in the parable and in the painting, embraces his straying son, full of joy that he's returned, full of joy that 
<clears throat> he can overcome the son's rejection with compassion and with mercy. I think that that's a very beautiful image for this Jubilee year. But as I mentioned, it's also an image for each of us. Because in this upcoming extraordinary Jubilee of mercy, you and I are called or invited to be like the prodigal son in receiving God's mercy. But we are also called to be like the father in showing mercy so that each of us have known and experienced God's mercy in our lives may then become authentic and credible witnesses of that same mercy to our brothers and sisters. Thanks very much.